it's good. Diversity is it. We we've lost the diversity in our soil and therefore we've lost the diversity in our own body, which is what I was talking about yesterday. So the more that we can get back to holistic practices of the way that we're going to be able to call in that micro yeah and diversify we're going to yeah. call in that microbiology that we've lost i, think I don't think it's lost forever <laughs>
pollinator. You all have it here in Michigan a lot. And right now the pods are opening. So you can go anywhere, maybe not on the side of the road where they're contaminated, but you can go grab a, hun a ton of the milkweed seeds and, and, and spread them all over your property and your gardens right now. That was one. And some of you were in here yesterday, and, and one thing we did talk about was just using biology of the water over the winter and, and wood chips, and there's different kinds of wood chips, and, and ram ramial, or ramial chipped wood is a term for branch chips that are from smaller trees so if you get wood chips from a full big tree there's just a lot of cellulose and a lot of heart heartwood in the middle of that but if you get um, bushes or branches and chipped wood it's more of a nutrient because you have more of the cambium layer and and to the to the heartwood so it's like really more of a nutrient for the soil so it's for as far as your carbon nitrogen ratios and letting it sit over the winter it's really useful to, to use that um, in the building of your soils over the winter. And it's like superfoods right now to the fungi. So fresh branches that you're just wanting to clear out, now is the time to do it for sure. Um, and as carbon farmers are carbon sequestering, you know, farmers on earth and trying to keep the carbon in the ground, we, we've stopped burning slash piles or any kind of burning on our property. and. We don't really like the far, fire smarting methods that are going on. We're just really leaving wild areas on our property and for, for habitat. We think that's really important because not everything can be managed and should be managed. And um, having wild areas is just really key to insects and everything to have around. Um, and then being able to utilize that wood or that kind of um, material on your land, um, on your building your uh -huh. That's really important. Yeah. So we were also going to talk about we, we talked a lot about what you could do to the to the to your actual beds yesterday. And now we sort of want to talk about what can you do with the borders? Because the borders of, of your gardens and the outsides of your greenhouses, even the outsides of your hemp fields, you know, we can go very large with this are incredibly important. Not do not only do they offer like barriers to um, you know, wind and knocking down some of your hemp plants late in flower, but they also offer a barrier from a lot of the spray over that's happening. You all live in a really big ag area. I see cornfields forever. I know that there's a tremendous amount of glyphosate that's being used around here. So when you have, you know, barriers around the outsides of your gardens, you're really going to be protected from that. Also, a lot of barrier plants such as fruit trees offer, which I said yesterday as well, and I'll say it again, is they offer the first flowering in, in the spring. So you're having hungry pollinators and crab apples are amazing. Like crab apples, when they drop their fruit, they create um, a beautiful microbiome underneath you know, it may not even be fruit that you would collect. And if you feel like you've already got a lot, a lot going on and you've got a big hemp farm, you know, and maybe you're working five to 10 acres, even just planting crab apples around the outside, they can sort of go wild and they create almost a natural fence. Josh touched on coptising and, and pollarding. Maybe talk yeah, about that so, now. Yeah, um, so, you know, there's different tree species that where if you cut them, then they sprout, sprout out a bunch of new sprouts on it and um, alder, um, chestnut, a lot of fruit trees, hawthorns. Hawthorns are not the best to have around because they have gnarly spikes. And if you want to be like a free, like, you know, barefoot hippie in the garden, that those can suck really bad. <laughs> but they are also heart medicine and really important to have around. So every, also just, and, and trees live a long time. They're different than our annual plants. They live a really long time. So there's a lot of longevity enzymes within trees so we like having um, trees around as much as possible so if you um, to if you want to have a barrier around your garden you can think of it as like a, a living forest or, or an eco not an eco but um, um, you know a food forest type thing where you, you have a bunch of living trees and willows and everything around your garden so you're creating habitat around your your gardens and, and a lot of these trees can be cut so some trees are like barrier trees you could do a, 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 a an apple fence and cut the top off at a young age and all the new sprouts that come off can be then cut and then put in the ground and you could do like 
every four inches you could do when it's going this way and then every four inches doing that way and weave them into each other and make a fence and you could even weave like uh, pears and cherries and plums and fruit any of the fruit trees are going to do it and this time of year with the water being um, so filled up in the water table so filled up it's a perfect time for those kind of branches to root willow is amazing for its rooting hormone quality a lot of people with clones use aloe um, along with uh, um, you know willow to, to do rooting hormones um, and they also create really beautiful habitat and they they are really easy to to weave um, so so coppicing sorry no it's okay yeah Pol pollarding and coppicing are two different terms they're kind of like old world terms in a way of, of agroforestry of these forests that you have here are really awesome and um, you have the ability to use them to, to your advantage and sticks are often overlooked you know everyone wants to just burn a stick or get rid of a stick but like I already said the stick is where all the trace minerals are and all the nutrients so cutting the tree having it sprout up or cutting the bottom like alders grow so some of them grow out of bunches so um, alder trees you can just cut the bottoms off and then they just keep sprouting you can use those long alder branches for fence posts we build a lot of our greenhouses out of that kind of wood because you know post and beam greenhouses work really well and you can just take a portable planer and just plane the top of it you know for the, the plastic part and that's you know something you're utilizing off your own land coppice and pollarding is um, agroforestry techniques that allow you to then further use that like in fencing and different things it creates habitat and flowers and also leaves um also another use for planting trees and low-lying trees um, is also you might be having areas of your field or areas of your property that are pooling water and we can utilize you know a, a lot of different tree species especially willow all of the different willows love to soak up a lot of water and if you plant them at this time of year you know this is the time to plant a lot of those small plants that Josh was talking about and if you have uh, cherry trees or you know any any trees right now you can just take a small cutting and put them wherever you want so this is the time now and they'll be watered throughout the winter and they should be able to root there, there's always you're always going to lose quite a bit if you haven't pre-rooted them but still it's been pretty interesting this how many we can crucial. get this groundwater is you, amazing you can do it starting um you know around christmas time and, and just have it all winter you know a bare root you know the brand new shoots that are coming out just cut the brand new shoots and put the bare cane just put the cane in the ground and you can make posts and columns too by just doing it in the circle and make columns and you can make i uh, like i think it's overlooked to use um, meditation circles and, and areas in your garden and so you can use living structures for that as well mm -hmm. um also one of the main importance that you want to think about when you are planting your pollinators is that so many of our pollinators are sick because of the spraying that's happening and because of all of the pollution and we're losing species because of monocropping and monoculturing. Um, in order for many pollinators to bring back their health and well-being, they need multiple different pollen. So not only do they need different pollen at certain times of the season, but even different pollen to heal different things on their body. So offering them one type of species of pollen may not actually be bringing in, you know, all the different pollinators that you want. And because they're sick, we're really offering, you, you know, food for them as, as well as medicine. So pollen, as we know, is one of the, the highest nutrient dense foods on the planet. There's nothing that's more nutrient dense than pollen. So the more of that that we can create uh, for our pollinators is great and and in that that area that we're talking about on the outside you know perennials are the, the thing to plant and a lot of perennials want to be planted right now um, and they're wonderful for borders because you don't even have to think about them and you all have such beautiful soil here and perfect weather like Michigan's awesome for these great perennials so 
I know some of you have pens and paper and I'm gonna just go through this quick like I did yesterday because this is gonna be recorded and put out. <coughs> but I have some a list of perennial border plants that are really awesome for this specific region. And, and a lot of them you wanna look into either now or right at the beginning of February. Um, so we touched on the fruit trees and the armoria. There's bleeding heart. Chives are some of the first bloomers that come up and they're so incredibly hardy. Wherever you put a chive here, there is gonna be bunches and bunches and bunches that come up. So the alums are great continuous flowering and it just creates a nice border because it's also a deterrent to a lot of different aphids and it's a deterrent to um, other types of uh, beetles that are leaf eaters. Um, so the candy tuff, clematis, if you've got anything that can hang, you know it's a vine. The coral bells, phlox, daisy, veronica, ice plant, foxglove. Foxglove, you all aren't um, familiar with that, that's a digitalis. Beautiful, amazing. It just keeps blooming and blooming. It comes back ferociously, and it's a great thing to have on the border because it's just so beautiful. And all of the tulip, I mean, all of the bulb family, so your daffodils, your tulips, right now is the time to plant them. They, they, they sell them in big bunches, you know, at your local farmer's market, and you can just get big bunches and put them on the border of your property. Um, Lithodora, peony, primrose, and dianthus. Those are all really awesome, continuous flowering plants that will do well here in Michigan to put on the border um, of your property. Mm -hmm. Want to say anything else? Yeah. yeah. So, um, did we want to move into now? Move back into fall and into winter? We've done the summer. So, um, we've just done all of our, su our summer. Uh, cover crop yesterday and now the ones after after the seeds have died after the flowers have died and the seeds have all dropped and and like I said yesterday you want to really think about those cover crops that have seeds because you want to be bringing in small birds and it's the perfect time to bring in small birds when they're when they're seeding because that's the time that the caterpillars start coming around and the birds see those caterpillars immediately and they would much rather have the caterpillar than the seeds, a lot of those birds. Um, so after they're all down, you can pull them up or you know, if, you, if you've got a spade, depends on you know, how, how big it is. We talked a lot about the different implementation of, of getting down your cover crop. But ones that are really great to have for um, fall and late blooming is asters. They're a perennial and asters are beautiful. They're bloom for an entire month. And if you have asters around your property, there's like anywhere I go, anywhere in the world, it seems like I can find you know five species of pollinators on asters. Um, dahlias, you have to dig them up here. I know that they don't overwinter, but they really proliferate underground and they're so beautiful and the bees love them and they bloom way late into the season. They can go all the way into October. Zinnias, easy to collect seed from, easy to plant. They're phenomenal. Deer don't like them. They really don't want to be around them, especially with all the green and the grass and stuff that you have here. They're not going to be interested in the zinnias. Um, Cosmos are the late bloomers, and then the scabiosa. Um, sunflowers and then grapes are another one to bring in birds. So grapes are late fruiting. You can plant them on your property. Even if you don't want to harvest them, the birds most certainly will and you're bringing in that habitat. Um, another one is mountain ash. Mountain ash does phenomenally out here. And it's a wonderful tree to start bringing into your, your gardens and into your hemp fields and, and whatever it is that you're doing. Um, also elderberries is another one to bring in those birds. So those ones work here in Michigan. Well, and the, the elderberries are a real amazing for medicine, making medicine and it's really good to have supporting plants for on your farm that you can use in product making if you're going to do that for your farm so yeah and we were just talking you know michigan i mean i want to move here because of the laws that you all have you all have the ability to grow a crop right. make a product and sell it there's no other state that has that ability 
That means that you all can be small, successful farmers. Absolutely. Right from the get-go. And products are the way to multiply the income from your farms phenomenally. To be able to have something that you can turn it into or work with another collective or group of people, which is gonna lead into us talking about the pure certification and what it's about. But the importance of working together collectively is, is great. And Michigan has set up that ability for you all to be really successful. Never in history, at least in the last hundred years, have youth been wanting to turn towards farming. So we've got the youth, we've got the attention of the youth. So a lot of us who have been in the industry for this for a long time, what are we gonna do with that? We, we have a responsibility to pass on something that you know really could change the way that we look at agriculture as a whole. And what an incredible opportunity, like the youth are paying attention. And it's the cannabis that is gonna continue to be a catalyst for so many things. And, 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 and the biggest thing is collaboration and community. And that's why we initially created the Pure Certification. So um, a lot of you have heard of the Pure Certification, but we'd like to tell you more about it. And what it is, is it was an activist movement in one form in the beginning because there was a lot of dispensaries and a lot of cannabis being grown and there was no federal lice I mean federal um, certification and USDA was was not recognizing it and and clean green was was operating and they were around and people were getting that um, but we didn't feel like that um, that their certification went far enough and that we didn't think that the, the USDA certification goes far enough because really it's kind of like product oriented and they allow plastic mulch and and different chemicals even if you don't have the ability to get um, something they allow you to spray chemicals which is just not cool and um, so we um, also have a nutrient company that we've had since 2007 so we've been certified you know getting our own products and, and sourcing out our own products and and asking for human toxicity tests on those because we knew that just agricultural tests may not be enough and we know that cannabis being as amazing as it is isn't a dynamic accumulator and uptakes anything that you put into it. So early on in our, um, you know, formation of Dragonfly Earth Medicine, um, we start. We've always worked with farms just in our whole time together. So we always had like a really good connection. But we wanted to start working with farms on being just conscious ecological farmers. Well, I wanted to just say something really quick. In in, in working with farms. And some of you understand what I'm saying is that we had a multi-billion dollar industry that was black market. There was no marketing. There was no this or that. You didn't know what it was that was happening. It was a multi-billion dollar successful industry in the U.S. that was based off of faith and trust yeah. in our community. Faith and trust in our community. And now we have that opportunity to carry that same thing forward but out in the open. And I think that that's just really powerful. So and so that so the, if with the pure certification, it's a free certification and it doesn't cost money. Um, and the reason why we did that is because we wanted to make it more powerful than just what money can buy. You know, we wanted to make it like, you know, do you have six closed loop systems? We just came up with six just because we came up with it. You know what I mean? And, and it, ma it made sense do. though because it was. You know, it falls in line with old world practices, biodynamics or permaculture or, or any other natural farming system that we've, that we've learned from through our travels. Um, and we wanted to incorporate all the systems together, the planting by the moon or putting crystals in our farms or fermenting stuff. And we wanted to, for farms to be able to have closed loop systems as a way of connecting with your land. It's a way of saying, oh, well, what can I use off my land, or how can I maybe ally with a, a close farmer who, who farms alfalfa? And also Maybe a way, that alfalfa farmer would farm organic if you, if you said, hey, I have a market for you. And also a way to pass your tests. So, you know, we have a good friend that lost 3,000 pounds to Azimax because he sprayed it in his early time nursery, something that's OMRI certified. 
and that's happening to everyone. That's just a close personal friend. And it was sprayed in his nursery and it came up in his concentrate. And, and that means that, you know, we, we don't have that capability as small farmers. We don't have crop insurance. We're still looked at sort of like the outsiders. We can use that to our advantage, which is good. But I think that it's really important that you know your inputs. It turned out that we were sort of doing it as an activist <coughs> movement for people not to buy things and to be able to create a price per gram that was affordable to the up and coming market. That's gonna help farmers, you know, stay alive. Well, it turns out that it's also helping farmers stay alive because of all of the stringent tests that are happening. So the more that you're closed loop, the more deep soil that you're in, you know, the better off that you're going to be because you are you know that you're going to pass all of those tests that, that we have in Yeah, campus. so the natural systems that we put together, that were, that were something we, we had worked on for a long time and a lot of others had too. Um, started to really pan out in the new paradigm of legalities with concentrates and the failings and learning about heavy metals are now a big thing and so people are testing a lot of products for heavy metals and we've passed all of our heavy metals tests with all of our products in all the states that that's necessary. And, and we went further as a collective and as a group and this is where working collectively can be very powerful. We did a lot of tests on a lot of the OMRI certified stuff and not just small tests, but also like glyphosate tests as well. And and it's phenomenal what's out there, people, because we're all trying to build soil and create beautiful living systems, and we're adding small amounts of glyphosate with every nutrient that we put on our soil, and over a period of time, we're killing our soil, and we don't know why it's gone acidic. A lot of it is because of the nutrients that you're feeding in there. So it's hard. It's like anything that you are putting on your garden, you have to ask for tests. Ask for heavy metals tests. Ask for pesticide tests. Ask for glyphosate tests. If they don't have them, tell the company they need to get them. It's not okay. Like these are really important things that they just don't test in, you know, even organic cultivation. They believe it's okay. And I know that it's sprayed heavily in this region and area. And then one of the uh, um, other moves was to move out of pots and to everyone who was working, you know, as, as, as pure certified didn't, couldn't grow in pots anymore. And that was for mostly, it's for outdoors. For inside, we have a few, Steve from Green Life and Derek from Grape Grows and, and a few people indoors, the um, Edel Green Swiss uh, his CBD Home Company. Um, and they all have, you know, alternative systems involved. Um, but they also have you know gone through rigorous testing and has has come out good it's free because it's community monitored and it's community run and and part of it is looking at everything holistically you know a lot of these third party certifications are based on what USDA tells us is a good thing and i'm not really interested in what USDA has to tell me is a good thing i feel like i want to have a certification that i share with a lot of other farms that represents my farms and that's another way that we can bring up this regenerative movement. If consumers, if we're continuously educating consumers and they see a label of importance of something that, you know, is represented by another farm that they recognize from state to state. So when you have a, a first party certification is what we call it because we're not following the rules and regulations of anybody else but ourselves as a whole group. We decide each year, um, you know, we're getting together in Garberville here really soon as a massive group. We're going to be talking about an indoor certification. We're going to be calling it eco-conscious certification. People are looking for something to set them apart. We need to be set apart. We need to do our marketing. We need to educate. It's no longer just put out a really cool logo. The best marketing out there right now is education and the youth and the people who are learning about cannabis want to know about it. They want to hear your story. They want to know about your growing practices. It's something now that's not only sort of in, but it, but it really could help this industry as well as many other industries to follow. So creating a collaborative energy like what we've done within the peer certification and you all can do it here in Michigan it doesn't matter where you do it but joining together with people that have like minds as you only can bring your own brand up 
and we are noticing, you know, now that it's been five years in Washington, it's been, you know, seven years in California where people are able to have the marketing. The farms that are doing very well are those that are telling a story to their consumers because their consumers want something that separates them from just a cookie strain. What separates you? What separates your farm? What makes you special? What makes you different? Because your success is important to the future of this industry as well as the future of agriculture as a whole. So we have, the, we have this ability to do it right. And, and that's gonna be through education. And luckily, I mean, regenerative farming and regenerative growing is, is there's a lot of attention on it right now. And, and I think it's because they're seeing that the other systems are failing. So, you know, these there's better flavor. It's better for the earth. Like, I, it's pretty much win all the way around. So, and I think we've established on, on how to do it. Now it's just really time for us to figure out how to work together. And, and that's what we've been you know, just stressing out, you know, the most lately is because people are joining forces with, you know, maybe it's corporations and they're not having good luck with investors. And sometimes we joke around about calling them outvestors because they end up, you, you end up parting ways because you don't see eye to eye on, on missions. So um, we would just like to suggest for people to, you know, continue to keep it small and more intentional. Um, and uh, and creating collectives also with the peer certification, we are going to be able to have, you know, every springtime before planting with all of our hemp farmers, they will be sitting in front of, uh, you know, many buyers for nutraceutical companies or organic tea companies or extractors that need the highest quality hemp. And isn't it amazing that we have the ability to collectively bargain together and we have the ability to plant our crops with what our buyers are already interested in. It gives us power. If we're just one farm that's trying to do that, it's very difficult. And we really don't want to be sitting ducks, you know, sitting on 10,000 pounds with nowhere to go. That's not going to help us. And I know a lot of hemp farmers are doing that right now. So pull, pulling together as a collective helps you collectively bargain to pull together. And then they're searching you out because you have the highest quality. And we know that the best nutraceutical companies in the, in the world right now are searching out regenerative flour of both the drug cultivar and CBD cultivar. It's weird to separate that, that's a whole other thing, but you know, can, different cannabis cultivars. And they're looking for regenerative practices because they know it's the right medicine. We know that we're growing cannabinoids that we haven't even discussed yet. And they know that we are because they've been studying this plant for 50 years. So they know something that we don't know because they're talking to our collective and they're coming to us and they're saying, hey, you know, we want to get in on this. So all of a sudden that gives us power as farmers that our end product is worth more. And as you're bringing new cultivars onto your, into your system and stuff, you know, don't just go on names, you know, look, try and look at terpene reports and, and get something that's unique, you know, and and, and maybe one without myrcene and then super high in pinene or limonene and those are it's 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 almost getting lost in the in the words and everything when you have strains and we have strains and everyone, you have to have strains so I, I think it's great with all the strains but to be able to learn more about the terpene profiles and and what what's in those and if we, and if we can get you know more into learning about flavonoids and and what kind of flavonoids are in our, our cannabis and how those kind of compounds can help us and different ways to extract those compounds in order to make them work for us is really important. Yeah, and also, you know, the big topic right now is patenting. And we're all really concerned about, you know, big ag companies coming in and owning certain hemp's and then you can't even plant anything that has anything to do with that varietal when those are varietals that they've been working on in Colorado for 15 years and we've all been working on them, you know, everybody wants to own something. So the way for them not to own anything is to put your shit into public domain. We need to be spreading seeds. As soon as you take your packet of seeds that you've got and you give it to 15 of your friends and your 15 friends give you back just a tiny bit of data, that's public domain. They no longer can own that. Whenever we, plant, whenever we patent a plant, it has to have prior art. It has to have no prior art in order for it to be patented. 
so it's our job as farmers, as breeders, to give these seeds prior art, to create brands and create seeds here in Michigan that are specific to you all. You're all sharing them. Nobody can come in and even touch that because of the patent laws, because you and your group and your community already created prior art. This is why breeding is so incredibly important. Just filling a hemp field with feminized seeds may get you one crop, but that's it. It's like teach a man to fish or give him a fish. You know, now, now is the time for us to be, you know, teaching ourselves to fish. We need to be breeding our own seeds so that we can put it into prior art. We can own those ourselves without having to go through expensive, you know, vegetable farmers have already figured this out and now we're just entering into it. It's time for us to look to our local farmers, look up what it means to be part of public domain and put, put things out in public domain and create your own varietals. One thing that we know for sure, a lot of people are talking about their hemp going hot. You know, everybody's hemp and different hemp going hot. Well, part of that has to do definitely with, with the seeds that they got and maybe them not being tested. But the other part has to do with that whenever we take a cannabis plant and we put it under tremendous stress, it spikes THC. THC is a stressor. There's a reason why our overdone varietals that we've had indoor for all these years keep getting higher and higher THC, dude, you know? It's because we're stressing our plants out. The high myrcene and the high THC is due to stress. When the nutraceutical companies come in, they're not interested in high THC, high myrcene varietals. They don't want to have anything to do with them. Those are, we're looking for full spectrum, full terpene, full cannabinoid. So when you're doing your chemovar and your pheno hunts, use, use the science that we have. You know, use your intuition and find the plants that work best in your fields or, or in your gardens or even in your indoor situations for you all who, who are breeders for indoors, you know. What, what is it that really speaks to you and then take it to the science. And then, and then really look at it. Is this worthy to keep into the future? Is this something that I want to bring to my community and I want to create prior art with? We really don't want to be creating prior art with all of these spent out high mercy and high THC varietals. You know, we have like hundreds of different names, but when you put it to a scientific test, they all look the same. That's just what we've done as a community. So thinking outside of the box and moving more towards you know, varietals that are land race and, and old genetics or ones that have a nose that are really different and interesting. Those are the ones that we want to start creating, you know, in, in our communities and, and with Appalachia and terroir attached to those varietals. Um, we have the ability to, to go back to, you know, farming times that actually were successful for communities. Um, we're also coming up with a certification for extraction um, because it's, it's really important to, to look at the process all the way through and a lot of us as farmers you know, only have so much control as to what happens, but how wonderful to be able to build this amazing network that we're building that you're getting orders from people that are making the concentrates because they want your flowers because they're a specialty or your, pre, your flowers are pre-ordered by other extraction companies and you're able to grow what it is that they want in your way. So these are ways that we can and help collaborate and, and that's what the peer certification is all about and that's why this community monitor and community run like we don't go to every farm we talk to people on the phone and then we hook them up with the local peer certified farmers and then those people go to that person's farm and then that farmer all those farmers can decide does this farm or does this grow represent what i'm doing does it represent my my brand my marketing my intention and, and that's how we're growing. And, and I think that as it started out as something that, you know, wasn't taken very seriously, but now we're creating a collective with like over 300 people worldwide. And we're getting together and, and, and any of you who are, who are doing these methods in a way that, you know, is intentional, we need people all over the place because this is a message that is gonna take everybody. I always say that we're all one drop of water, but together we're a flood and, um, yeah, so are there any more questions about the peer certification or even about the fall cropping or the summer cropping that we were talking about or anything that you guys are feeling like, yeah? Would you recommend like any microgreens if you wanted to do like a microgreen cover crop like in an indoor setting? 
I mean, we have a friend who is a cannabis grower who is now a microgreen grower and is making 10 times more money as a microgreen grower. So microgreens are awesome. They create, you know, amazing life and fodder for microorganisms. Any kind of, it's just, it's just fantastic. And any time that we can grow things in our indoor and in our outdoor that create more pollen for, you know, the pollinators or more nutrients, it's good. Diversity is it. We, we've lost the diversity in our soil and therefore we've lost the diversity in our own body, which is what I was talking about yesterday. So the more that we can get back to holistic practices and the way that we're going to be able to call in that micro yeah and diversify we're going to yeah. call in that microbiology that we've lost i, think it's I don't think it's lost forever <laughs> and we talk about the species that are gone on the earth you know we're talking about the snow leopard and all of these big species that we can see but we're losing beneficial microorganisms by the billions species that are just you know gone and it's no wonder why you know all of us are sick so this is it, it, it's benefiting all realms to, to have gardens that are in line with nature and in line you know with our own intuition as human beings as a part of nature not manipulating nature but as a part of nature and um, growing mushrooms underneath your your plants is really smart or even growing mushrooms anywhere on your land is really smart and that's well I mean uh, psychedelic ones would be good, <laughs> and that would be Address something you would do, here. you know, on the down low, yeah. of course. But there's two Psilocybin. kinds of psychedelic ones, which would be wood-loving mushrooms, which you would grow on wood chips in your forested areas, and you can use cyan essence or azure essence or different ones like that. But making compost out of um, cow manure allows you to grow um, cubensis. And um, there's multiple different strains from different parts of the world that you can do that in. You can do it outdoors mm -hmm. in the middle of summer. And there's also the Garden Giant, the King's Tropharia, that we super recommend. Anytime that you want to do um, a fast compost pile or you're just piling and layering, to add the King's Tropharia um, inoculum into your gardens or even into your small garden beds or even into your indoor beds if you're, you know, have large beds. They're just awesome. They're delicious to eat. They're beautiful to look at. They breathe in CO2, or they breathe in oxygen and out CO2, which is the opposite of plants. So having them underneath your plants is this beautiful symbiosis of airflow. That's exciting. And they, they compost down nutrients from microbes really rapidly. They build organic matter faster than almost any other mushroom. Did you have a question? Or a statement? Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, you can do it pretty low tech too, like with, yeah. with mushroom. I think it's a misconception that it's difficult, like I the agree. sterilization process and all the, all the things. It's like once you just get started and mess up, if you mess up the first time, I feel like that can give you the motivation to do it better. And it's really fun. It's just like a matter of getting into it and just- Yeah, yeah. making compost is, yeah. you know, it, it really gets you into making compost because you're kind mm -hmm. of, sterilizing you know or, or not sterilizing totally but pasteurizing in yeah. some way and you guys have shaggy manes coming up right now i saw yeah. them on the roadside and shaggy manes are like one of the best things if you even has a small patch patch of grass or something in your gardens or in the, your front yard right now you can just take a slurry of a bunch of them put them in a blender with just a couple of pinches of earth salt and spread them on your lawn and within three years you have the most beautiful lawn that anybody has ever seen and every fall they'll come up in numerous amounts that's how easy you know spreading mushrooms and can be another it's really easy if you give it a an opportunity of where it wants to grow and a place uh, you know um, a bunch of food of, of what it's interested in it's going to take off um log log spawn and log culture is another thing that's um really possible in gardens so that's just you know plugging logs and you have to get something that's a living that's not dead or that's alive so it doesn't have any competing um, organisms in the wood and then you have to have some kind of soy wax or some kind of wax that you can cap the ends where you cut it and all the little holes and then you buy or, in, or inoculate yourself some logs uh, get like pegs like birch birch pegs is a lot of times what people use but you can grow um, reishi, maitake, and lion's mane 
um, underneath your, your cannabis. For example, you could make a raised bed out of l really long logs and have those bed logs inoculated. And then you're walking, you know, maybe in a three stack of inoculated logs and then eventually there's gonna be like mushrooms popping out and also exchanging, you know, oxygen for CO2 while you're doing it. Um, reishi logs oftentimes are buried straight in to the ground. So, or lion's mane too. And lion's mane is really awesome because lion's mane is a, as a nootropic, you know, regenerative cell, cell building um, uh, compound, which is really good for your brain and just good for cells. So we always want to regenerate our cells if, if, with health. And, and all these are pretty easy. We've been able to have, you know, really great success and just sort of playing around. And sometimes, you know, we don't have to put all of our energy and all of our money into R&D. We always tell everybody that, you know, it's 30% work and then 70% like R&D around the property that still gets stuff done. And even the smallest projects, if you see them from the beginning to the end, well, you've just created data for yourself that's going to really help yourself, uh, you know, hire the intelligence for your following year. So you could even use um, logs as sort of a top mulch to your, to your bed. So you could just lay a bunch of logs across the top of your bed and it would just really keep the moisture in I don't your know bed. if Michigan would need that. Maybe in your dry, arid regions. Well, I mean, you'd Maybe never have to UP. water your beds. Yeah. Like you would just, it would just be a, yeah. all dry farmed pretty much all summer. And we have been hearing a lot of dry you, farming in Michigan. So check out, check it out. You know, everybody gets to do their 12. See, see if you have an area that is tapped into an underground aquifer because the, the groundwater is so <laughs> right there that uh, we've been hearing from a ton of people that are saying, oh my gosh, I learned that I have a dry farm. Oh, I learned that I have a dry farm because there's a layer of sand and small pebble rock that go through a lot of this farmland and during certain times of the year, it will just flow and it's totally wet and the roots can just tap right into that. And that means that you don't have to water ever. And that's really awesome. And not a lot of places have that ability, but Michigan does. All right, well. So I guess most importantly, we just want to encourage you to create habitat and really embrace polyculture. And with cannabis, you know, just um, use natural systems. It's better for the cannabis. It tastes better. It's better for humankind. And really, cannabis is a master plant that really awakens us. And we feel a dedication to that evolution. We really recognize that you know, it's one of the plants that we've had in our whole entire evolution. And I think Kelly and I just most importantly want to respect nature and, um, and, and respect our well-being and moving forward. We want to be growing and smoking and, and doing all this, you know, at 99 and beyond. Sounds real healthy. Um, and um, <laughs> we really do... Um, feel like we're one part of a, a really big whole, so we'd like to really recognize all the other DEM pure, pure certified farmers that and are out there. And people that are not even and certified that are doing that are amazing work. Doing things. So many people. We've had a lot of your medicine, really, and it, a lot of you could be up here talking as well. So we just really um, appreciate your time. And moving forward, we would like to be available to you all as allies and um, as uh, support in any way and moving forward um, if you can work together here that's really awesome we can help you know connect you all to other places and we're really excited to do that so mm -hmm. um, big love to you all uh, and no no question is is too silly or too small we really take a lot of energy and effort every day to answer every question so please reach out because if we don't know the answer, somebody in our collective does. And we utilize our collective almost every single day to learn more, you know. We have so much to learn. This was my, uh, I guess, 29th year uh, planting cannabis. And I feel like I'm just beginning. I feel like there's so much more to learn. So whenever we do get questions, it's such an opportunity for growth too. So 
do reach out um, at, on the DM. Get Instagram really mad at any email. of your friends that are using plastic mulch. With yeah, their and fun. down with the plastic mulching. This is a remediator plant. It's just not okay. It's not. I it's mean, not okay. and, and I know that at the end of this year, when the plastic mulch gets piled up on the farm and they have to take it to the dump, guaranteed they're not going to feel good about themselves, no matter how much good medicine they've provided. So we can encourage you know mulching and polyculture there's a, a, a really a lot of different ways to grow in the field and that's where the real impact to the earth is so if we can all help um our field farmers that are coming in now you know with hemp and every and everything we these indoor techniques that are being used and <clears throat> and even small scale back backyard um, operations can be brought to scale it, it, it is possible and like we said yesterday we don't recognize scale farming as it is right now as successful. So we're, we don't see it. There's no comparison to that. So all of that is a giant failure. So anything that we do and moving forward is, is important. So we're encouraging rather than do 50 acres of hemp with plastic mulch because you have that kind of machine, maybe do 10 acres fully intentional mulched with habitat all around and, and, and create right those that and, and, and get a unique varietal, not just CBD. I mean, everyone knows CBD, but hemp is just anything not THC. So the future is already CBG this year. Next year it's CBDV, you know, released by Oregon CBD or, or other farms. Um, so in any varietal that you can isolate, I mean, breeders are taking large plots and doing mega pheno hunts on regular seeds because even THC seeds can be of CBD variety and that we learned that through Wade from House of Harlequin he created the Harlequin strain and that was from a THC varietal and he was grounding his pots and you know with with copper wire you know into the earth so that your pots are grounded and the pots that he grounded turned to CBD, and that's magical, and, and that's, that's super, where comes and that's from. why it's practical. And fractal also, medicine. I have another thing on the other side to say is that fully tested hemp seeds, high CBD, barely any THC varietals went in a government project over to Israel. Israel picked them up, ended up being up to 13 to 14 percent THC because they were stressed, because those plants didn't understand that area, because it was a drought area, and because those, so then, isn't it awesome, this plant has the last laugh every time. <laughs> she has the last laugh every time, so it'll be really interesting to try to pin her down, you know. Why is it that hemp didn't continue forward? What we did was we planted it all in the, in the 50s and the 60s with GMO cotton because it could be modified. This plant is an adaptogen. I don't think that it can be. I don't think and we I have think, to worry about no. the GMO week because the wheel will just be like, eh, and yeah. something else. Yeah, like what am it's I? Never the the same. Same. No. It's, it's never the same. It's never the same. It's always different. So why yeah. patent it? I think we should be more excited to create something the next yeah. year. We've always given seeds out or, or you know, gotten, yeah. and we're excited to see what happens with it. And them. everybody wants to know, like, what do you guys think about patenting? And we're just like, by the time you get done plant patenting, we've already created nine generations of things that we're way more excited about than we wanted to plat patent them. Like, that's so nine years ago, we don't want to have anything to do with that. So again, the more that we create, the more we create this prior art and current and stay ahead of it, you know, that's what's gonna that's what's gonna keep these small farmers and businesses and 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 more of the youth wanting to come out and farm hemp. And I think having a field test kit would be really nice as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's Josh and I. No, dream. but that's smart. Yeah, because you're because that's another thing you can get as a collective. You can work together with families and test all your seeds, and it's fine to use a lab. That's cool too. But not everyone does, and maybe you don't know, and maybe it's too expensive. So getting together on field test kits is really smart. And really, that it, it is the future to know your cannabinoids and your terpenes and, and, and flavonoids and, and everything moving forward. So. Well, thank you guys for coming out. It's yeah. really awesome to be here. And also just, just thankful to the earth, you know, for providing this and thankful to you all. And, 
you know, we're all doing our best. 